Uh, hi everyone, I'm Tan Zhao from NVIDIA and I will host this Mika Industrial Talk. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Yun Liu from Google Health, who is going to talk to us about lessons on the path from code to clinic. Dr. Yun Liu is a staff research scientist in Google Health. In this role, he focuses on developing and validating machine learning for medical imaging across multiple fields, including pathology, ophthalmology, radiology, and dermatology. Yun completed his PhD at Howard MIT Health Sciences and Technology, and he worked on predictive risk modeling using biomedical signals, medical texts, and billing codes. He has previously also worked on predictive modeling for nucleic acid sequences and protein structures. Yun completed a Bachelor of Science in Molecular and Cellular Biology and Computer Science at Johns Hopkins University. Welcome, Dr. Liu. Hi, uh, th thanks everyone for, for joining. Um, uh, and just a quick note, uh, I think my video share is disabled uh, on, on the host site, so if you could enable that, that would be great. Yeah, we can see your video. Okay, uh, so the screen is showing up, but um, am I showing up as well? Yeah, we can hear you and see you. Uh, so, okay, uh, we can see your slides, um, not your camera. I, I see, yes. Yeah, so um, when I try to turn on video, it says that it's disabled on the host side. Oh, okay. Yeah, can you share a camera now? Yes, that's okay now. Sorry awesome. for that. Great, thank you, no worries. Uh, so, um, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, tuning in to the talk, um, wherever you are in the world. Uh, for some, it's really early and some it's uh, quite late, so thank you. Um, so today, I really wanted to share with everyone some of the uh, lessons we've learned um, when we uh, were developing AI for healthcare applications. Um, and so uh, on this path, it turns out that there were a lot of lessons that weren't immediately obvious to us when we first started, uh, but that we were uh, learning or re-seeing those lessons pop up in many different applications again and again and again. Um, so uh, most of my talk will focus on some of the ophthalmology related work that we have embarked on, uh, but a lot of lessons, as I mentioned, will uh, have shown up in um, many other applications and you'll see some of the references as we go along. Uh, and finally, I should just uh, you know, really thank uh, and, and mention the fact that uh, this work was done by many, many uh, talented and hardworking individuals. Uh, and so it's just my privilege to represent that work today here. So um, a lot of the work really delves uh, with uh, making artificial intelligence based tools. Um, and a lot of that is really uh, being built on uh, machine learning technologies. And some of these technologies are actually uh, all around you in many of the products that many people may use day to day. Uh, so just some examples here, uh, Google Photos, if you search for the word dog, um, it actually does pull up uh, you know, photos of dogs that you may not have annotated um, as dogs yourself. Inbox and Translate, these are both sort of like language modeling tasks that need to try and understand what the language is. And in the first case, then suggest some uh, possible outputs that you want to provide. Um, and you know, really it has to understand that and understand what possible uh, uh, responses are also valid. And on the right side, it's a really language um, so sequence to sequence modeling task where it's really trying to take as input some kind of language and then output the same content in a different language. So all of these are in sort of like more, the, more of the consumer space. And we also see the same thing happening across many, many teams, both in Google and outside of Google, really working on many different applications of machine learning in uh, healthcare and beyond. And nowhere is this more apparent than if we go to PubMed or uh, elsewhere and look for papers about machine learning uh, in healthcare. And uh, over the past decade or so, there's been explosive growth uh, in this area. But if we look around, there's really not quite as many of these things um, in real use uh, quite yet. And uh, there is uh, a few barriers towards uh, doing that. And I will try to sort of like uh, string together some of these lessons into, uh, into this narrative here. So one thing that seems um, to, uh, to make sense is that uh, you want more data to produce a better model. And many of us who've done this kind of work before know that more data, generally speaking, does help the model get better, uh, but that's not the end of the story. Um, and I'll talk about why. The second thing that is uh, part of the barrier is that uh, if you have a accurate model, that's all you need. 
to create a useful product. And unfortunately, that's also not the case. And there's a lot more that goes into creating something that's usable, an actual tool that's usable uh, than the actual modeling. And the last one is that if you create a good product, and that will be something that people will uh, actually use in the system. And unfortunately, that's also not the case, and we'll discuss why. So the first myth, data and how it helps you improve the model. Um, so before we go there, there's just very quickly a uh, re recap. And for many of us, this is very, very um, sort of like standard stuff. Uh, the way we're training many of these um, deep neural network models uh, nowadays is really to get labeled data and uh, then to pass it through a neural network. And uh, then it tries to guess at what the output is. And, through, and if it gets it right, that's good. If it doesn't get it right, uh, there is a process by which it learns uh, the errors uh, and propagates it back. So really the, um, the heart of this is really having the data available. And a lot of times the data comes unlabeled and we have to then add labels to that data. So that's exactly what we did here. Um, so in this particular application, what we were trying to do was to take photos of the back of the eye, so retinal fundus photos shown on the left. And the goal was to really uh, see if there's any level of diabetic eye disease or DR uh, in the eye. And these are five different grades ranging from none to proliferative. Uh, the model also, as an aside, does a few other things, such as looking at image quality and other factors. Now, the model itself, this was work um, from uh, something like seven years ago at this point. Uh, the model itself uh, at that time, uh, even, even then, wasn't particularly um, uh, innovative. It was really an off-the-shelf sort of like architecture. But what we did to get the data is highlighted here. Now, I'll point out some numbers here that are really uh, interesting. First of all, there's 100K images and 50 ophthalmologists. So that's not a surprise. You do want more people to label the images because it gets it done much faster. But we collected 800,000 diagnoses. And so um, why is this number bigger than this number? Well, it turns out that we did get multiple labels per image. And I'll show you why on this upcoming slide. So on this slide, what we're uh, envisioning, what we're visualizing here is that every row here is a image. One of those images you saw on the previous slide Every column here are the grades uh, by uh, ophthalmologists. So what we see, what we really want to see is that there are bands of colors and the colors represent what grade they are. And we want, really want to see uniform bands of colors, kind of like a rainbow from top to bottom. So horizontal colors, uh, but that's not what we really see. Now we do see that there is um, sort of like uh, some trends in colors ranging from blue to some greens, yellows, oranges, and reds at the bottom, but it's far from uniform. And two particularly interesting examples are uh, this row here, this first black row here that we highlighted, it has one of every single one of those five grades. So this is kind of um, shocking when we first saw it, uh, but if you step back and think about it, many of these gradings are actually somewhat subjective. And so there is some amount of intervariability and to some extent, even intra-observer uh, intra variability as well. So how do we solve for this? Well. Um, it turns out that one thing you can do is actually just to increase the amount of data that you uh, you get. And so uh, this is a plot of um, performance against the amount of data. And many of us may have seen this in many of our own work. And what happens generally over time is that if you increase the amount of data that you have, the performance tends to, I'm sorry, the performance tends to increase pretty dramatically at the start, and then it plateaus over time. And part of this plateau is just that there's, um, for this given configuration of the machine learning model you're using, uh, it is just not able to get a uh, much better performance. In this particular case, it also is the case that the performance itself was saturating near uh, 100% for this particular uh, evaluation metric. Now that's just the plot in terms of the amount of data. Uh, things get a bit more interesting when we think about what happens in terms of the labeling. So uh, one thing that's uh, sort of like a, a lot of us know and appreciate in doing machine learning is that instead of just having one data set that we train everything on, we actually have multiple splits of data. Uh, one data that the machine learning model actually sees and is used for training purposes, um, that's usually uh, generally called the train or training set. And then there's another split uh, that's called um, in, some, uh, in some fields, the, uh, the validation set, in some fields, tuning set, and it's been called many different names. But what this split is being used to do is used to uh, select the best model. So you can use it for early stopping, checkpoint selection, and many other things. But this split is not what the model directly sees as a part of training. It is just used to tune uh, what is doing the best and to really just sort of like have intermediate tests of the model. And then there's a separate set that's used for actually evaluating the model way at the end. And that's called the test set or validation set uh, if you're in the clinical world. And so 
Uh, the reason I, I uh, discuss this is because if we label the train set versus the tune set, it turns out they have remarkably different properties. So here's on the right what happens when we take all of the grades that we have and we start dropping out grades per image. So on average, we had almost five grades per image. As we start dropping them out, if we do it for the train set, we actually see that the performance doesn't decay all that much. Interestingly, we, we do that for the tuning set, performance drops quite a bit over time. And so our takeaway from this particular experiment was that it really mattered uh, what you're doing with the tune set. And so if you're able to label things uh, many more times to get better labels, um, just dollar for dollar, you're probably much better off getting the tune set labeled uh, to start with. Ideally, yes, if you're able to get everything labeled, that's, a, that's great as well. So as we applied those lessons, um, what we uh, ended up uh, being able to do was that over a period of about a year, uh, we managed to get um, uh, the team set labeled by uh, labeled and adjudicated by retina specialists as opposed to general eye doctors. And what we saw was that the performance of the model actually improved from being kind of like on par to uh, general ophthalmologists to being on par with retina specialists in this particular study. So that was basically a quick overview of the fact that, you know, really sometimes if you label things once, you're getting some amount of noise in those labels, and that turns out to, uh, to actually make it much harder for you to create accurate machine learning models. Um, and one solution to doing that was really to add multiple reads. Uh, there, uh, there also are other, uh, and, and when we do that, we can take a majority vote. There's other things that one can do, adjudication um, and, or, or sometimes arbitration. And uh, it turns out there's many ways you can do that as well. Um, what we've done in a lot of our work is to do this asynchronously, meaning that um, physician A, let's say, looks at the image, leaves some comments, and then B and C does the same thing completely independently. If their opinions do not match, what happens is that that then goes, about, uh, goes again in a round robin fashion back to the first person uh, in a random order. And then the first person looks at the comments by everyone else, and then they try to arrive at a consensus asynchronously. And what this does is really helps us to scale up the way that we do this adjudication. Uh, and the reason is that if you do this uh, synchronously, you really have to get these really busy physicians together at the same time you know, to discuss cases, and that can be quite uh, difficult. The other advantage of doing this asynchronously is you can then blind the uh, readers to who the other people are. Uh, so for example, physician A doesn't actually know who physician B is other than the fact that it's, a pre it's another uh, labeler in this particular system. The advantage of that is that um, sometimes what we have uh, seen is that there's a bit of a loudest voice in the room phenomenon. And what happens there is that physician A may defer to physician B's opinion, even if they don't agree, because physician B is, let's say, more senior or more experienced in this field. Uh, but more experience does not mean that they never make mistakes. And so really having this unbiased way of doing this adjudication and doing it asynchronously over many physicians is really, really helpful. Um, and uh, as I alluded to at the start of the talk, we've learned this lesson and applied this in very many different contexts. And so there's uh, ophthalmology, dermatology, uh, and radiology and pathology where we've um, done variants of this kind of uh, labeling. Um, and so beyond just labeling the same image that the model is looking at, uh, sometimes it can be much more useful to look at auxiliary sets of data, so other kinds of data input. So um, what I mean by this is that if you're looking at a cancer case, uh, sometimes it's useful to look at the longer term, uh, the biopsy or the outcomes that are associated with. And I'll show a couple of examples of us doing this uh, in the ophthalmology space. So here's one example where um, the task is very, very similar to what we were looking at before, taking as input a fundus photograph. So that's the back of the eye. And then what we want to predict is this particular kind of diabetic eye disease called DME. And in this case, instead of saying, hey, let's get physicians and graders to label this fundus photograph, can we get them to label something else that's associated with that photo? In this case, this is called an OCT. Um, and OCT gives you, as opposed to two dimensional images, it is a three dimensional, and this is one slice, it's a 3D representation of what is going on near the retina. And so when physicians are able to use this technology, it gives them a much more granular view of what is going on within the eye. And they, through that, they can get a much better sense of whether this particular condition is present or not. Uh, in fact, this technology is used uh, in terms of uh, understanding treatment uh, for this disease. And so this is actually the right modality to look at. However, most, uh, most screening programs do have to use this cheaper technology, this 2D imaging technology, in order to uh, scale the screening programs up. And so this is much more expensive and, and slower of a process. 
Uh, so if you're able to do this from the 2D photos, it turns out to be much more, um, much better for in terms of understanding uh, who can benefit from this. So when we did that, um, here's what we found. The um, original model that we had that was trained just on labels on this 2D photograph, so that's the one in magenta, this particular line here. When we, and then if we look at um, how physicians are grading this, their score is this yellow dot over here. So we were doing a little bit better. There's a bit of noise because of the size of this particular data set, but we're doing a little bit better back then. Now, once we switched to labels from this OCT technology, there was a, quite a big leap in this particular, um, uh, in, in the performance. And so it was much better than a previous model. And also, uh, you know, again, much better than uh, the physicians at this particular task. I should note that the physicians here, uh, the ones that read the 3D imaging determine the ground truth. This yellow dot only represents those who are doing the 2D imaging. And so to some extent, this represents a difference in the way that they're doing the grading because they're trained to look for things within this particular part of this image. Um, and so we've done quite a bit of work in this space. Uh, some of the earlier work was mostly proof of concept, and then we evaluated on much bigger data sets across multiple countries, uh, hence uh, the many different references. Um, and then uh, this Mikai reference here actually uh, is, if you're interested, feel free to look at it. Uh, but what we're doing there is to trying to understand, you know, what is the model looking at? How is it able to see 3D insights from a 2D uh, image? And so there's some interesting things with PsychoGANs uh, that we did in that particular work. Another example of us looking at different kinds of data is to try and predict the future. And so in this particular task, what we were trying to do was Here's a patient that comes in and uh, they didn't have any uh, diabetic eye disease at that time point at T0, but we know they follow up because it's a retrospective patient. We know their follow up over time for the next uh, several months or years. And so what we could then do was to say, what is uh, their outcome in terms of did they develop these uh, eye diseases in the future? And if we do that, we can feed in that as a signal to the model. Again, this is not something that necessarily people know how to do, uh, this is something that is sort of like a auxiliary signal from the future. So this was really a hypothesis. This was even possible. So when we do that, we actually do find that the model is able to uh, determine and identify patients who are more likely to get uh, diabetic eye disease in the future. Uh, this is Kaplan-Meier plot. And so what we see here is that the uh, low and medium risk groups um, tend not to develop it. But the ones that the model identifies being high risk of developing eye disease, they tend to get uh, many more of these events. Um, and so uh, this red line separating from these two other lines is uh, the main indication of that. And I've added many references here, mostly because we've done uh, this sort of thing in many different applications. Uh, this work was in monography where they were trying to predict uh, cancers that develop um, after. So including cancers that develop a year or more later in the future. This work was uh, us looking at pathology slides and looking at um, determining uh, outcomes from pathology slides. Uh, and then uh, this is the current work that we're talking about. This one was for, uh, for tuberculosis, where the goal was to predict whether the chest X-ray image actually had tuberculosis that didn't show up if you do molecular testing. So we've seen this sort of like setup where we're predicting not a label that's coming from the image itself, but from some other source uh, in many, many different applications. Now, just as an aside, um, because the, uh, this audience is probably quite interested in this, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about how we generally do these machine learning tasks. And the way we approach it sort of like uh, traditionally by this point is really to first say, hey, let's take the model and let's expose it to a bunch of data sets. Uh, and then it's doing supervised learning to predict something. And there's something that we're predicting has nothing to do with the medical tasks that we're interested in. But what it does is it gets the model and especially earlier layers um, ready for, uh, for further use. And, uh, and then we take that model, we throw away some parts of it, and then we retrain and fine tune that model for some medical task of interest. So this overall sort of like transfer learning process is something that's very, very commonly done even uh, a few years ago. Now, what we're seeing more and more in these recent years though, is that there's uh, a lot more steps being added in the middle. And the question is really, hey, can we improve this? Instead of just training directly on these, th these like non-medical images, can we train on something that's kind of like in between? So not labeled medical images, but also not non-labeled, uh, not labeled non-medical images. So it turns out that um, a, what a lot of people are doing is trying to leverage unlabeled or you know, noisily labeled uh, medical data. Here's one example where uh, what this is capturing is just a loss function for a contrastive loss. And what this is doing is to say, let's take an input, an image that we don't know the label for, 
we take random crops for it and we then we train this contrasted loss to try and learn that images that resemble each other from the same uh, particular image it's probably uh, probably the same image and much more similar to each other than stuff from different images so this is sort of like the classic Sinclair loss that some may be familiar with uh, we've done this before for uh, Sinclair as well as for um, uh, supervised contrastive loss where the difference is instead of taking crops from the same image we take crops from the same class and so um, and then the class labels there are coming from something uh, more noisy as opposed to labeled because if you have to label it then you're back to this regime where it's much more expensive and slower to do um, and so uh, these kind of uh, this kind of like pattern of doing an intermediate self-supervised pre-training step uh, tends to help the final performance. Here's an example of how it can help. These are three different tasks. Um, I, I believe these are actually from three different modalities, pathology, uh, chest x-ray, and uh, I believe one is ophthalmology. So what we tend to see here is that if you do the traditional transfer learning approach, you see that's this um, orange line here, versus if you do some amount of uh, self-supervised learning, that is this blue line here. And you can get, depending on the data set size and how much of this unlabeled data you have, you can get uh, quite a substantial uh, amount of uh, benefit uh, between and the difference between this blue and orange lines. Um, so we've done this in a few different settings. Uh, some papers are under review and some are uh, have been published. So let me just sum up quickly the uh, the first myth. And so the first myth was that uh, all you need to do to get a better model is to get more data. And on average, if you get more data, indeed it does help. Uh, but really it's not about the quantity, it's about you know the quality, how you're labeling it, you know, is it you know noise-free? Uh, what kind of data are you getting it from? Is this the actual image or is this something that's more relevant that's from auxiliary source that may take time to develop? And then finally, how do you use it? Um, do you use are you able to leverage somehow the unlabeled data in addition to the labeled data? The next step, so let's say you, you now have a good performing model. The next step is how do you turn that model? Uh, into an actual product. And uh, in, in this phase, um, what's really important in the clinical world is to remember that a lot of the times what we need want to do is to really validate and validate and validate. And the reason it's important is because there are many different settings where your technology might be used. Uh, and the settings can be very different in the real world because someone is taking a photo, the patients are different, the devices may be different, the environment is different. And so as, it, as these domain shifts happen, you really want to be sure that your model is still able to operate well. So here's a rough timeline. Um, two of the papers I mentioned earlier, uh, this was a JAMA paper, this was the paper where we used adjudicated ground truth to make it uh, better. That happened over the first couple of years or so. It took us a bit more time to then work with partners in Thailand and India to then really um, get more data and test uh, the, those, uh, test the, the model in those, um, in those settings. Uh, and so you know, we're really, really appreciative uh, of our partners for working with us um, on this. And uh, one thing I would just point out in this particular picture, as we were testing it, um, you know, it, it turns out that you really want to be able to present the model results in a way that's both understandable by the local, uh, you know, healthcare uh, professionals, as well as uh, presenting the specific data that they're most interested in. And this particular case, this screenshot here, uh, is one for the uh, the user interface of um, the way the diabetic eye disease uh, model works. Um, so this next slide really gets at, you know, if you're able to create a product that then has a reasonable user uh, interface around it that is usable by people, what actually happens in the real world when you put that into, we add that to the mix. And so uh, this particular um, sort of like diagram, the details are not super important, uh, but what it's sketching out is every single step that happens when a patient arrives and then the nurse has to do uh, and work with the patient to collect some data points and then take the photo and then provide them with more information before they leave, as well as what happens to them in terms of the later follow-up, whether they see a general physician, whether they see a eye doctor, and so on. So if you look at this flow chart, there's a lot of things that are happening. Uh, that, and the part where the fundus photo is being uh, taken, that's just this one little box right here. And if we get very, very detailed about how this workflow uh, works, you'll see that we actually are uh, sketching out exactly what is happening where, where is, what devices are changing heads in which location, and where is it going to? Is it a separate room? Is it in the same place? Uh, that sort of thing. And this is really important because this is the real world. This is what's happening. If you're not able to figure out a way to integrate into this particular workflow, then what you've done doesn't matter because no one's gonna use it. Um, if, it's, if it's something that they have to drive a few hours to New York City and do something special there, 
they're not going to do it because the, the real world time constraint is not going to allow them to do that. So what's really important here is just really to understand what's happening on the ground and to figure out how do you best integrate into this overall system. And when you do that um, and you solve these challenges, then it becomes a delight for the people on the ground to actually use the, the technology. And we've seen early signs that if you do this right, then you get additional benefits that were not technically a part of the original model. So uh, this particular um, uh, uh, paper right here um, in, in Nitrum Catalyst, what we found was that there was some early data where we, we, we showed that if patients got the results of these uh, eye screenings immediately, as opposed to waiting for a few weeks, which is what usually happens, then they were much more likely to set up an appointment and then go for the appointment with the eye doctor, meaning they're actually getting their care that they should be getting. Uh, and part of the reason is because if you, um, you know, if you leave the clinic and you get, uh, you know, and you get the results a month later, it's really easy to have life just catch up and you're just not able to, to, um, to uh, prioritize the, the appointment at that point in time. So um, after we were able to really just nail down what the, uh, the workflow looked like and how do we best um, you know, optimize for that workflow with our technology, uh, what we managed to do was to launch this um, nationwide uh, uh, you know, uh, eye disease screening as part of this study with the Thai, uh, Thai DR program. Um, and so uh, this involved nine clinics from around the country and 7,000 consented participants. Uh, and really this was just uh, really being able to see this technology being used in the real world by, uh, you know, by real people across the country. Uh, and so this was really um, humbling to see. So that's kind of like wraps up the second take home message. And uh, the second message is really that after you've created a model, there's a lot more steps that need to happen before that model becomes part of a useful product. So it's not really about, um, in order to get sort of like uh, something that becomes a, you know, a good product, it's not about just the accuracy, it's about really how do you make it usable? How do you make it useful for people? And who are the people using this? And what are they doing in the real world? Like how do you, uh, create the technology and, and make it such that they can use it in their daily workflow without having to do a, a bunch of additional steps. Now, the third uh, aspect I wanted to talk about today is really about if you do have a good product, does it mean it's sufficient for clinical impact? And it turns out uh, it, the story is a lot more complicated than that. Um, and so this is the real world. The real world is not you know, a, a trial where things are all cleaned up. The real world is people sending in lines, taking time out of their busy days, and uh, and physicians also busy in the background and seeing patients back to back to back. So how do you figure out how to get this into the real world and how do you get systems to adopt something? Uh, it has to make sense for the system overall. So we have some work in the space that's sort of like under review at this point, uh, but I'll highlight work um, you know, similar to this uh, by, by other teams uh, and in this particular case, so the team from Singapore. Um, and so what they did was to really uh, sketch out in their particular system, what happens to a patient in the context of overall system. So this is not about a workflow. This is about in the system, the patient goes to a particular grader, they get graded and then they're followed up later. And in each of these steps, what is the cost to the system? And so uh, what they did was to then say, and then if we do this and say, this is the current system, we can then integrate the AI in two different ways. And this is what they evaluated. The first way is to do a fully automated system where the AI is just um, routing the re referral uh, to the eye doctor, yes or no, just on its own, completely auto autonomously. The middle pathway that they sketched out was what if we use this in a semi-autonomous way? And what that means is that after the AI does a interpretation, there is a manual check only on the referable cases by human graders. And the reason this referral, this, this is being done is because if you do refer the patient, they have to go see an eye doctor and you see the eye doctor uh, that has its own cost for both the patient and the system. But in addition to that, they may then get treatments and stuff that they, uh, they may or may not require. So having this secondary check here is really, really important. So they compared these three pathways. And interestingly, what they found was that the autonomous pathway does indeed save uh, save costs compared to the traditional pathway with, where there's multiple human graders grading the image, but that the overall system actually benefits from a semi-autonomous uh, grading. And this is a bit surprising because 
um, you know, aren't we doing one additional step here? We're actually having grading uh, done by, by people here in addition to the AI grading. So shouldn't it strictly cost more? Or it turns out what, the, what makes a big difference here is after you're referred, this referral to the eye center has a particular cost. And when we develop systems like this, because we want to make sure that it is safe, we actually do sometimes err on the side of caution and refer people uh, just to make sure that they are being seen. So it is sometimes the, refer the referability rate of these AI systems are a little bit higher than, a human, uh, than what a human would have done um, for safety reasons. And so this secondary check here really helps to, to temper down that rate of you know, so-called false positives, but really just out of caution. So uh, the surprising sort of like insight from this is really that you know um, having a uh, autonomous AI just working on its own may not be more cost saving than using this more intelligently as part of a broader system. Um, and so uh, you know health economics and, and outcomes research like this is really really important to understand from a systems perspective. Does this make sense? You know, are we saving costs? Are we adding more costs to the system? Um, and you know what is actually happening. Um, there's, of course, additional things that need to happen outside of the system because this deals um, specifically only with cost uh, and, and the, the additional things are uh, around outcomes of patients and there's uh, definitely studies happening uh, in this particular area. So just to sum up, the, the last myth here is really what is, um, you know, a product is not sufficient to uh, create quote unquote impact and to be really used by everyone uh, unless it makes sense for the system. And the system includes people, the patients, like do they wanna to travel to the location to get, uh, to get care? It includes the clinicians, are they busy or you know, are they actually gonna use this technology? If, if they're too busy to do it, that's not really gonna help. So who do you get to use the technology? And the overall system, both in terms of costs and health outcomes. And uh, many of these studies are starting to show up in the literature and we're, we're very happy to see that. Um, so just to quickly conclude, uh, more data is good. It generally helps, uh, but it's not sufficient. You really have to think about how you're using the data, how you're labeling the images, and how do you get better quality uh, data into the models. The more diverse the, the, the sources of the data, the, the better it is for the model as well, because you reduce the chance of having data set shift and other, uh, other uh, issues with it. An accurate model is, is also not uh, sort of like um, uh, sufficient for a useful product. You really have to take a human-centered view to designing the product, to understanding where in the workflow that is happening, and then to make it all as seamless as possible for the users. And uh, finally, just building a product uh, that's good and usable by people is not quite sufficient. You do have to look at it from the overall systems perspective and ensure that from a cost savings, health outcomes and other perspectives that it really does make sense. So um, this is uh, the last slide in my talk proper. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, yeah, may I ask a question first? Um, when you mentioned that getting more data from more um, clinicians, so what if the different clinicians give different labels? Will you simply train them together or you have different methods to weight them? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we did different kinds of work in this space. And um, should I flash this slide again? We did a lot of different kinds of um, sort of like work in this space. Uh, some of the work we did involves around uh, sort of like more of the, the improving the labels uh, aspect. And what we've done is to say, hey, we're giving graders guidance and some instructions on how we would like them to grade and label these images. Uh, and it may not be exactly the same as what they're doing clinically. And part of the reason is because clinically they might have access to much more information about, let's say, the patient history and other things that we may or may not be able to provide um, uh, during the grading of these images for our purposes. Uh, and so we do need to figure out sort of like the guidelines and language we're using, making sure that they understand that they're aligned with that. And so sometimes we do multiple, multiple iterations of these um, sort of like the guidance documents and instructions. Um, so that's on a label improvement uh, front. Um, other times what we've done with these is to, uh, sometimes we just actually literally feed in uh, like the more noisy labels. Uh, and so every say mini batch that the model is seeing, it might be seeing very slightly uh, different labels. Uh, and what that does is it adds a bit of structured noise to the labels, but in a sort of like a real world sort of like setting. And uh, for a lot of the times, you know, if you're doing that on the training set, the model actually can generalize and just learn from that noisy data and it just sort of works out. 
Um, other ways you can do this are to really incorporate some of these um, noise into uh, in, into the modeling sort of like itself. And uh, there are some work that we're, we're working on right now where uh, this might uh, be the case. Um, and then I guess uh, lastly, there's some stuff that I mentioned around uh, adjudication and arbitration where um, you know, it really to get people to actually resolve their disagreements and to actually change the symbols uh, and you know, hopefully for the better. Occasionally we do find that there's sometimes unresolvable differences. And so in, in that situation, we have to figure out, you know, what do we want to do about it? And um, on the application specific basis, we've adopted different strategies. Sometimes we take the majority there. Um, very occasionally we have to uh, make the choice that maybe this case is too ambiguous for it to be uh, actually used for evaluation. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the Q&A um, from how Durgan, uh, what is Google's vision on healthcare? Uh, yeah, so um, that's a good question. Uh, that's, um, so I think slightly outside the scope of these, this specific talk, um, I, I would say that you know the overall vision is that uh, healthcare encompasses many, many different steps where um, people are seeking information first and then making decisions and then you know, getting to the healthcare system uh, generally. So um, I would say that you know, a lot of the work that we are doing uh, concerns um, how do we improve every step of this journey uh, for, for a user. So there's some work, for example, over at YouTube Health where uh, they are partnering with, uh, with organizations to get um, higher quality health information um, into hands of people. So if let's say someone's looking out for how do I manage my um, my particular disease condition, right? They should be able to find information from authoritative sources as easily as possible, and then be able to understand what is it they should be uh, doing for the condition. So that's sort of like on the informational side of things. Um, other aspects that we are uh, working on is really doing sort of like a lot of this research in understanding how do we use technology to really help out with this process. And there's many different teams working on this. Um, some of the teams, uh, you know, work on something that's more wellness related. So for example, uh, Fitbit and some of the features there are really wellness focused. Um, other features may be a, a really medical feature. So for example, um, Fitbit actually has their AFib uh, detection feature actually live in the watch. And so um, that's something that went to the FDA. Yeah, thank you. Another question from Ya Bing Yuan. That's a great talk. My question is, when you bring the AI models to clinical environment, as AI models are generally considered as black box. How to explain these models and the output to the clinicians? And what would you suggest to increase the trust to AI models in clinics? Then. Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Let me try and break down the question into, into multiple pieces. Um, so I think that, uh, I'm looking for the side. So I'll answer the last bit uh, first. Um, so the last bit was really about, you know, um, how do you increase trust? And from a clinician perspective, trust is really gained by having repeated validations and showing that it works again and again and again in different environments and on different patient populations. Um, and so uh, that's a question that sort of like really pops up to the top of mind of clinicians reading these papers where it's um, really about, hey, does this work, this technology that I'm describing, does it work for the patient population I care about? And one thing to do is to try to look at um, kind of the classic table one, which is to try and look at the patient population that your study was dealing with. And does that reflect and represent the patient population they care for on a day-to-day -day basis? So really, you know, getting that trust really entails doing a lot of these validations again and again. Um, another aspect of this is just sort of like about, uh, you know, kind of explainability and, 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 and the black box piece of this. So I think it really depends on, first of all, like how the technology is being used. So let me skip back to this slide for a second. Um, and so, you know, in, in terms of how do you get a trust, it depends because, you know, your users and the people that make the decision on whether to use the system may differ based on how it is being used. So in this particular case, how this system decided to evaluate their system was to say, uh, there'll be autonomous system in this particular pathway, and there is a collaborative system in this pathway. And depending on which one it is, it may be that the users actually don't directly, um, the, the users on the ground may not be the clinicians, the users, on a, the users per se might actually be the administrators, other folks who look at the data and overall decide whether this seems to make sense uh, for them. And then lastly, um, the question on explainability uh, is a good one. Let me try and go back to one slide where, um, so I don't have a slide specifically um, on this, but here was one example where we're doing work 
to correlate 2D images with 3D findings. And so if it's a 2D image to a label that people are seeing from it, they can do a bunch of explainability saliency techniques to highlight you know, the lesions that it's uh, detecting. And that's sort of like um, well-known in terms of how one can do that. And that does increase trust. Um, when we get to these so-called so, so novel predictions, it becomes much more tricky. Um, this particular uh, paper that we did was using CycleGAN to take a, uh, a normal image and then generate a counterfactual, meaning how do we take this normal image and what would make this normal image more like an image with the condition? And uh, in this particular case, we could actually run that GAN multiple times to make that to actually accentuate that difference. And what we actually saw was that a lot of times I was able to see things uh, that's more subtle within the central region of this particular image uh, than others. So especially when it comes to novel predictions, it's really important for us to try and understand what it's looking at. Uh, just another very quick example, when we try to do the same thing for this uh, work, where, where the model was trying to predict the future of this particular patient, what we then saw was, um, it was actually quite interesting. Um, so what we saw was that when we applied saliency here, for some of these lesions, the model started highlighting things that were that really had nothing visible in the current image. Occasionally, what then happened was if we looked at the future image, the one from two years later, we found that the patient actually started getting lesions in that region of the image. So this was actually quite um, surprising. It didn't happen all the time. It was only some time, but when that did happen, uh, it was quite surprising that the model was somehow just able to pick out differences that were just not perceptible to the human eye. Um, and so uh, we're sort of like, you know, still investigating and thinking about how to interpret that. Um, other times, you know, it's, it's sort of like, it's highlighting something that just sort of like visually doesn't quite meet the threshold for being a lesion, uh, but that the model thinks is, you know, sufficiently um, uh, suspicious. So um, I think that's the explainability, but let me know if I'm um, not covering any parts of your question. Yeah, thank you. Another question, um, are you focusing mostly on classification tasks? Uh, great question. So um, I guess the question, uh, I can interpret a question multiple ways. Uh, one part of the question is um, classification versus regression. Uh, and we have done some work on the regression side uh, in terms of understanding whether we can predict things like um, cardiovascular risk uh, as well. Well not, well, not cardiovascular risk. Um, in terms of blood pressure, hemoglobin levels and other things from fundus photos. Uh, so we have tried the regression approaches. What we have found is that oftentimes when we, um, when we compare the regression approach to the purely classification approach using sort of like, let's say a bucketed approach um, where let's say we take the, uh, the full spectrum of prediction values and we bucket it into three, four, five different buckets. If we compare that and then um, it really depends on what the final goal is, right? If the final goal is regression, then you kind of like have to do that. But if the final goal is actually really to make the decision around a binary threshold, we found that a lot of the times the, bi the binary version tends to do a little bit better, or at least on par with the regression approach. Um, we've also tried ordinal and other approaches and really just experimenting with these. It's very rare that we see a huge difference doing, uh, doing a regression approach. Um, a lot of times we've done the classification approach because when we try to consider uh, kind of like things in overall context of how we're training, we often are using uh, auxiliary tasks to do multitask learning at the same time. Meaning as opposed to just doing disease classification, many times, you know, beyond that, we actually are doing other uh, tasks. I actually have a slide on this. I'll quickly show this where we actually do have a model that in addition to the disease classification is doing things like, you know, what is the image quality? Is this a left or right eye? Is this pointed at the center of the retina or is this off to the side? That's what this field of view refers to. Um, so all of these auxiliary tasks, um, they, uh, they are helpful, but mixing, and, but a lot of these auxiliary tasks are classification problems as well. And so when we're trying to mix classification and regression losses, it gets a little bit tricky in terms of how you reweight them. Um, and a lot of times it's just, um, it's just one more thing that you have to tune and it hasn't yielded amazing results for us. So that's a classification versus regression thing. And uh, sorry for the long answer. I'll quickly cover the other way to interpret that question is do we also do stuff in the um, survival modeling space? And so uh, over here, I believe we modeled in the, in the published version, I believe we, this was based on a classification based approach because that was what was easiest. Um, in some of these other papers, uh, for example, this one uh, in plus one, we actually have done more of a uh, direct survival modeling law. So um, you can check out that paper if you're interested. So uh, we've done things beyond that as well.
Yeah, uh, thank you. So is that, there's another question from Michael Gu. Hi there, this is a very informative presentation. I'm especially interested in the setting where images are from modality A and the labels are from modality B. Are there situations where the recovery of the label is fundamentally infeasible? For example, X-ray images and labels from sort of chemical screening. How to navigate that? Also, where can I read more about these types of studies? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, um, it's a great question. So uh, let me restate the question a little bit. Um, and generally, the question was about, I think, basically this slide, where sometimes we're looking at an input image. And ideally, the label comes from some other source, in this case, 2D versus 3D. Um, and in a perfect world, for every single image in the 2D space, you will have the 3D image or the report associated with the 3D image. And then you can make that association directly. Um, so the question, I think, was really about what do you do when that's not present? Um, so I think there's many different ways to answer it. Uh, the first question is, you know, if you are doing this, like what is the, um, from the application domain perspective, what are the implications uh, of, of doing it in different ways? And what I mean is the simplest way you can do it is uh, drop examples where you don't have that auxiliary information source. When you do that though, it means that you're changing the patient population um, that you're examining in many situations. And the reason for that is that a lot of the times the data is not missing at random. The data is missing because someone made a decision after seeing the first image, not to get that second image. And so when that is the case and you drop it, then it leads to a very structured kind of noise that's very, very hard to compensate for. And this is a sort of like a, 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 a downside of doing any kind of retrospective study where um, you didn't get to make the decision of who gets that more in-depth modality. So, you know, this is an advantage of sometimes if you can do prospective studies, if this was a 3D imaging, it's non-invasive, you can probably do it for everyone. It's more costly, but you can. Uh, if this was molecular testing, you can also choose to do it for everyone. We're doing that actually in the tuberculosis space right now. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and so you really have to look at it from the application domain perspective. Now, on a technical perspective, let's say that we, uh, we decide that we need the, to keep actually the images for all of these cases. Like, what do we do uh, for situations when we just don't have it, but we actually do want to keep it around because otherwise it skews the patient population only towards, let's say, those with something suspicious in this uh, image. Um, I guess there's a lot of ways to, to tackle it um, from the technical perspective. Uh, the problem is, how do you know you're doing it right? And what I mean is, how do you know when you've tried these different techniques that the final outcome is right if you are missing that data fundamentally? And really, I think the, the end of the day, what you really have to do is to figure out a way to get the prospective study in place and really test that. Um, because if you're not able to do that, then you can tune this all you like and you, you can't really get results. You can't have confidence that what you're doing is leading to the right result. So just very briefly, the way some of the ways to do this are um, perhaps you have auxiliary tasks that take the input image that um, it's not the, the, the other modality, they can propagate the loss uh, through, even if you don't have this thing. And so what that lets you do is that you're still taking as input this um, uh, image, even if you don't have this particular loss, and that lets you uh, sort of like um, still have the image be in the, uh, in the data set. Um, other things you can do there is occasionally, you might be able to um, essentially pretend that you have some kind of output for this. And uh, you know the, some the ways to do that you can do sort of like a human or expert oriented way where you get people to actually give you labels for that just to be like, hey, you know, if you think you you were to do like say the this image and modality for this, what would that be? Uh, and sort of like just you know pretend to hallucinate and just for and this is just for training purposes. Again, for evaluation for tuning purposes, you're much better off making sure you have that data just so that you are um, not falling into the situation where it's not missing at random. Then uh, it's a problem for your study design. So hopefully that addresses. Thank you. Another question from Sumana Basu. So this isn't a research question. Having clinicians in the loop is great, but also time consuming. What are your suggestions and finding such clinicians interested to put that amount of time and effort? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it depends on what you mean by the role that you want them to play, right? So clinicians are basically the, the domain experts in uh, presumably in, in the uh, application domain that you're interested in. Um, and so uh, 
if you're saying that you have one collaborator and you want them to label 2,000 images, uh, that may be quite difficult of ask. Um, so uh, sometimes you have to figure out like, you know, what are more efficient ways to do that? Uh, you know, either using actually machine learning approaches or other things. Um, you do have to be careful that um, you don't end up with a situation where you, you can't claim your evaluations unbiased, right? So for example, um, let's say you have a you know, proof of concept model, you use the model to make predictions on a test set, and then you get a clinician to verify those predictions. Uh, um, and th you know, then it's very difficult to claim that your, your evaluation is independent of what the model had predicted. Um, so you have to really figure out like, what is the right way to do that? Um, so that's on the labeling front. And you know, maybe what you can do is instead of getting uh, you know, the, the most senior clinician to ask if some of their medical students and, and fellows and, and other more junior clinicians are potentially available to help with that. Um, what may be a better use of your senior clinician time is really to understand the problem better. Uh, because um, I think from my perspective, what one of the biggest failure modes is not the work being done itself. Like I've seen a lot of really technically sound work and really interesting work. Um, what becomes tricky sometimes is if the application domain and the prediction task and the overall setup that they were working on is not usable in the clinic. That becomes kind of like, a, you know, a much bigger barrier in many situations. Um, so, uh, so I think, you know, really if they're busy, really figure out a, a, time, a time with them to figure out like what is the most valuable thing to work on and really choose your problems uh, you know, carefully.